All right, looks like we're live. Uh, stupid live dot things there are still. Okay, stars enabled. Looks like we're good. What's the star? It's like a form of uh, like cheers or like uh, like a monetary contribution, so they can actually oh, like gotcha. give us stars, which is has a monetary value to it. Which I think they just just enabled that just recently, but it's not even really a thing. So, welcome everybody. Looks like we're getting some people in here, which oh, is great. Doctor Nick wants to join, and Doctor Nick wants to join, so we will let Doctor Nick in. Hey, Lisa. <clears throat> Hope everybody's having a great week so far. We're just trying to get our friend Dr. Nick in, which looks like he's in. There, there he is. is. The man, the myth, the legend. Welcome, sir. Hello. Sound all right? Sounding good. Yep. All right. Well, well, much for ado. Thank you, everybody, for joining us uh, for this live Q&A. If this is the first time you're joining us, we are taking your questions and answering them live for you. We've got Patrick Largy, our uh, husbandry manager here on site. And then we've got Dr. Nick uh, over in California, who's our resident veterinarian expert. And so we've got a list of questions we're going to go through here today, and we're going to answer them for you. But uh, as before, if you haven't seen these before, um, we take your questions live also in the live chat, and we'll do our best to answer them there as well. So if you've got a particular question that's stumping you or maybe something that's just not working out the way you like or you just got a general question about keeping your fish corals or otherwise this is the place to ask and get your answers um so just a quick reminder we do this every wednesday at 1 p.m cst so if you haven't already go check out our facebook event uh, excuse me facebook page events tab uh that's where we have all the reoccurring events so you can go check it out in rsvp for the upcoming one of course feel free to send along your question in advance and we'll uh we'll add to the list so Without further ado, I think we'll get started. Uh, first question off the list today is for Dr. Nick, and most important thing to test for in an aquarium. Uh, so we're talking water quality here, which is you know the primary important issue for keeping the fish healthy. We've talked in previous ones about different water quality issues, and this is going back to well, what do you do to make sure the fish are healthy in the water? So the few things that you can test for that are easy, you can use uh, test strips or a test kit. Uh, also for temperature, a thermometer, either a digital thermometer or just a, um, you know, a alcohol thermometer, the little red one that floats in the tank and you lift it up and look at the reading. Um, but the easiest thing to check is the temperature. Make sure that the thermometer in your tank shows that the water is appropriate for your fish, which may vary by species, but typically somewhere between 72 and 82 degrees Fahrenheit is the appropriate temperature for most tropical fish. Some fish like cooler water, um, but in general, if you're like in the 70s, it should be okay. So testing the temperature is really easy. If it's too low, you need an aquarium heater. If it's too high, you may need to uh, make sure the sun isn't shining directly on the aquarium, get it out of any heat, away from any heat source. A second easy thing to test that's important is ammonia. Ammonia is excreted by the fishes through their gills into the water as their waste product. So instead of producing urea in urine like mammals do, people do, uh, fish produce ammonia. And ammonia will leave their gills from the blood directly directly through the gills into the water. As the level of ammonia increases in the water, the level of ammonia will increase in their blood. And eventually it will get so high it will kill them. So unless you're <clears throat> monitoring the ammonia, especially in a new aquarium where you don't have a biofilter with beneficial bacteria growing to break down the ammonia, you will see ammonia toxicity and that can kill your fish. Um, it's kind of called new tank syndrome. When you set up an aquarium, everything goes well for a while, you add a bunch of fish, and then a few days after, or a few weeks after, all the fish die, or some of the fish die because of the ammonia buildup. 
Ammonia, you can test with a test strip or a test kit or take a water sample to your local pet shop and have them test it for you. If you do see high ammonia, there are products you can buy that will add to the aquarium that will break down the ammonia. Uh, they actually bind it into a non-toxic form. You can also add bacterial supplements to your filter. The live bacteria will break down ammonia and uh, help convert it from ammonia to nitrite, which is also toxic, and then to nitrate, which is non-toxic. So measuring ammonia is important, water temperature. The next thing would be maybe pH. The pH should be pretty stable, and it should be between about 7 or 8. Saltwater fish, about 8 to 8.4. Um, and as long as it's not jumping up and down, the fish will adapt to it. If, if it's going from high to low because of um, chemicals in your water, that could be stressful to the fish. So try, trying not to do a whole discourse on water quality, um, pH, ammonia, and temperature would be the first things to check. And then you can also get test kits or test strips that measure uh, alkalinity, which is carbonate hardness or KH, uh, uh, hardness or general hardness, GH, and uh, nitrite, nitrate. And then on salt water, you might also, of course, you'll want to measure your salinity, maybe calcium uh, and, and copper for salt water. Does that uh, kind of cover that? I think, what do you think, Patrick? Yeah, I think so. I think, uh, you know, in the past, we've, we've talked a lot about water quality and uh, I've always said, you know, do everything in moderation. You know, fish like a very stable environment. You don't want to change your water too quickly. You don't want to feed them too much, too often. You want to make sure everything you're doing in small doses. That way the fish in the tank can adjust to the water as it changes. So, for sure. sure. Awesome. I'm going to take a question from the chat here from a Dustin. Uh, white slime in the lure tank he needs help with. Um. When I think of white slime, I think of either possibly, I don't know, maybe something showing up on the substrate. So I'm thinking maybe like that's food that hasn't been eaten or you know, food from the tank will form like this kind of like fuzzy. Um, or maybe some die off on some live rock or maybe like a white slime on a piece of driftwood. I guess you'd have to be kind of more specific. All right, well, we'll look for some more information on that one. Uh, moving along then, this one's also for Dr. Nick. Uh, best tips and tricks for preparing driftwood for your aquarium? So, you know, wood naturally floats. So it's kind of hard to, to just stick it in your tank and, unless you just want it floating around. However, there are some woods that will, once they're in the water, absorb water and start sinking. There's some specific hardwoods that are better than softer wood. So certain wood like balsa wood, which is so light, will probably never sink. Uh, but some wood, especially the dense wood, uh, uh, what they call iron woods, there's several different species of, of wood that's very, very dense. Those will sink. And a lot of these can be soaked in water. Uh, it, not in your aquarium, but in a separate tub of water. And it might take a week or a couple weeks and the water will soak into the wood and the wood will get waterlogged and then eventually sink. Also, it will release organic acids, including tannic acid in the water, which will make the water brown. So rinsing it off and replacing the water periodically is important so that you're, you're leaching out these um, chemicals from the wood uh, and taking them out and rinsing them. Eventually, though, the wood will um, pr produce less uh, tannins. It will uh, become heavy and sink to the bottom, and then you could uh, maybe boil it one time, <clears throat> you know, drop it in boiling water to disinfect the wood to make sure that there's no bacteria, fungus, or other items on the wood. Talking about the, you know, the white slime, that's probably just some organic sludge, uh, maybe with some bacteria or fungus on it. So, Taking that out and boiling it to, to kill those microorganisms and then rinsing it off would be helpful. <clears throat> and then put it down into your tank where you want. You can use some rocks even to, to help hold it in place. If it's a real piece of wood that you think is attractive for your aquascape, but it's not sinking, uh, maybe a certain branch that you wanted to aquascape on, you can also attach the 
wood to a piece of plastic or plexiglass or even some, some kind of a stone using some glue or wire and then bury that portion under the gravel so that it acts as an anchor to hold the wood down into the position where you want it in the aquarium. And that's another way of securing the wood. So even if it floats, you can make it sink and stay on the bottom. Great. Uh, I'm going to pivot back to Dustin's question because he uh, he just sent us the picture in, uh, in the Facebook Messenger. So I know you can't mm -hmm. see it, but um, Patrick can see it here. So uh, we'll let Patrick invest a little bit more and maybe see if, it, if this helps you. Um, you know, I'm looking at some some film on the glass. It could be possible that that are going on in the tank, which are, um, I guess you'd say, like very similar to like a cyanobacteria infection where you actually have a lot of like, um, bubbles forming. You know, you get like the slime and the bubbles will form and it will coagulate when you you know, it. so something like that, you definitely want to make sure you your um, your flow. There could be a lot of dissolved nutrients in the tank too. So you want to make sure you get some water changes in there, and also um, cut back on the light, the time of the lights. <coughs> Dinoflagellates can be really, really toxic to any um, low-lying inverts like snails and hermit crabs too. Like they'll actually kill them. You know, oh, yeah. so. Some people think, oh, I got this slime growing in my tank. I'm going to add some um, snails, but it'll actually end up killing the snails. So. <laughs> cool. Well, hopefully that helps, Dustin. Uh, thank you for the photo. Thank you for the question. Move along. Uh, for Patrick, this one came, this one, I've seen this one a couple times. Uh, best way to dip coral. Okay, right. so, yeah, so here in the coral farm, we uh, periodically dip all of our corals with Revive. Uh, it's by uh, Two Little Fishies. Revive, we sell it. Um, we go through that in the coral farm quite a bit here. So we dip them occasionally here. Um, generally, we don't dip them like, usually we wait about 48 hours after they come in because usually when they come in, especially if they're transient items, we've got to be careful. Get some water changes in there. And um, transient items, you've got to be careful. Oh, get some water Um, so when you get new new corals, sometimes you want to make sure that they're in really good shape. If they're a little stressed or something, you got to be careful with dipping because it's just going to add to that stress level and may push it the edge. Mm -hmm. But here on the coral farm, yeah, once they've settled in, we'll dip them for mm -hmm. any any critters. We'll just go by the um, the recommended dose on the revive bottle, and um, you know we make up big batches and we'll do it. You know we'll do them by um, panels, mm -hmm. essentially we call them, and we'll just put them in the dip. Um, and then we dip everything before we send it out. And then also for polyps to get rid of any, um, you know, stray algae and stuff like that, we'll actually do a diluted hydrogen as well. And really depending on the types of algae, you got to be careful with how long you put in the diluted um, hydrogen peroxide. Usually we just do about 60 seconds or so. Yeah. I'll do about a 50. Dr. Nick, anything you'd like to add to that? Uh, sorry, I was trying to look at the Facebook photo of the slime, so uh, that's okay. Okay, moving along then. Uh, this one's also for Patrick. Uh, what are the advantage of sump filters versus canister or hang-on filter? Uh, this is a pretty loaded question. I mean, uh, so some are great for uh, saltwater aquariums. Like most people think that you have, if you have a saltwater aquarium, you have to have a sump, which isn't necessarily true, but sumps are great because it for a number of reasons, it can add to your overall volume of the tank. You know, you're talking a lot of sumps are 10, 15, 20 plus gallons. It actually adds to the total volume of your tank, which is always important. It gives you a lot more space to add um, extra equipment, dosers, skimmers, stuff like that, because a lot of skimmers, um, the best type of skimmer are actually kind of like in sump skimmer where, you know, if anything happens, they'll overflow back into the sump, which is always great because if you have an external piece um, if it be flood your house. But um, thumbs are great for that. They're great. They hold a lot of media for messy fish as well. I mean, you can certainly add them to a freshwater tank too. They're not limited just to salt water. Um, using filter socks is great. That's another um, good form of uh, mechanical filtration because it captures the really fine particles. You know, a lot of people want really clear water, and you can really do that with a sump. Uh, 
canister filters. Canister filters, I feel like, really have a good place in planted aquariums because it's a uh, completely enclosed filter. Like, there's, if, as long as you put the outlet underneath the surface of the water, there's no um, gas exchange. Not actually CO2 water, spreading CO2 for your plants. So canister filters work really well for planted aquariums, and they also work well for um, tanks with messy fish too, because you can really put a lot of uh, filtration media in there as well. Um, so last one, oh, hang on filters. Hang on filters are probably your most inexpensive filter. Um, they're really basic. For most of them have like a filter cartridge something like that. They're really simple to use. They hang on your tank. They hang on the back. Um, I mean, they make hang-on filters pretty much for smaller cranes, but they go up to about 100 gallons or so. Uh, you can buy pre-made uh, filter cartridges. You know, you rinse them out, you in. Really simple to use. Um, so those are kind of reserved for your uh, more basic setups, you know, smaller bio load, you know, running your run fancy, you know, fish. Guppies, Tetris, stuff like that. Cool. Uh, Dr. Nick, anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, so uh, that's a real good synopsis of the main filtration types. Uh, the kind of couple secrets are the bigger, the better for filters. So whatever filter you're getting, get a bigger one and you'll be better off. You know, even if it tells you how many gallons it will uh, filter, you know, always try to get the biggest one you can afford for your fish because the, the filtration is really important in maintaining water quality. And as we mentioned, water quality is the most important thing in keeping fish alive. So a better filter, a bigger filter will help with that. There's three components that uh, Patrick mentioned on the different parts of filtration. There's mechanical, chemical, and biological. So the mechanical filtration is removing particulate matter from the water, so taking out the solid waste. And that's usually some kind of a membrane or sponge or pad or filter that traps the debris as the water goes through it. Those do need to be removed and cleaned periodically. You can usually reuse them. You just have to clean them off and put them back. If they get really dirty, they'll impede the water flow, and then your filtration won't work anymore. Uh, so that's important to clean that on a regular basis to get the debris, the sludge out of it. The second part is chemical filtration. You may or may not be using that. Things like carbon, which removes uh, dissolved organic compounds. It'll remove chlorine. It can remove other items from the water. Uh, zeolite, which can remove ammonia from the water. Or there's phosphate binding chemicals that you can put into little sacks or have them impregnated inside of a membrane that you put into the filter. So there are different uh, chemical media that you can use in your aquarium to remove certain water contaminants or things in the water. But you have to remember all of those have a finite capacity for absorbing. So once they're full, they're full and they need to be replaced and new ones put in. And then the most important is the biological filtration. And that's the beneficial bacteria that live in the aquarium that break down ammonia to nitrite and nitrate. They also, the heterotrophic bacteria will break down solid waste particles into uh, the smaller particles. <clears throat> and it's important to keep that bacteria alive. If you do anything that, like rinse the filter media with hot water or with, with any kind of uh, medication can kill the bacteria. So you gotta make sure you maintain the beneficial bacteria alive in the, the filter. And so after you clean your filter, you may have reduced the population of bacteria. So it'd be good to monitor your water quality afterwards for a period of time. Um, also maybe using some live bacteria starter back into your filter to get the bacteria going again. Um, but as far as the different types, it just depends on your aquarium, your finances, and how much room you have. Uh, for your filtration system. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, actually, a question for the um, the inch and a half inch, excuse me, Pals ask inch and a half Fahanka. Fahanka buffer currently in a quarantine tank gallon for deworming. Eating well, putting on weight, at what size can we move to a 100 gallon system where it's the only inhabitant? He's concerned about too much flow and difficulty finding food. I'll let you, Patrick. Yeah, I mean, if he's eating well, I don't see a huge problem putting him in a larger aquarium. 
I mean, he's going to probably feel the off that size tank, you know, moving from a 10 to a hundred gallon. Tank. I would probably the biggest thing to be worried about is because uh, puffers by nature are kind of meters, you know, stemming to the last question about biological filtration, there's probably going to be a lot of um, extra food in there that may not be eaten or um, make a filter. So you want to make sure that whatever you feed him, you remove the, um, the excess food because that's going to build up and you're going to have an ammonia problem in the tank for sure. Hopefully that bigger tank is, you know, cycled. Um, I know you said that he's going to be able to get in there, but if you can limit the flow a little bit, I would, but I would put him in a tank and just see how he does. I mean, because you got to think you're going to have a filter on your 10 gallon tank that's moving hour. If you put him in a 100 gallon filter that does a thousand gallons an hour, it's probably about the same amount of water movement. So I think as long as he's eating well, he should do perfectly fine that. But I would just worry about that excess food going to waste and water quality. Yeah, it sounds like you're doing all the right stuff, Kyle, too. So good on you. Um, good on you for the quarantine and, and take, yep. you know, proper precaution steps, getting them into your place. So. Yep. Um, this next one is for Dr. Nick. How to prevent toxic buildup in pond or aquarium? Okay, so we already talked about water quality and ammonia being the most common uh, toxin that can accumulate in the water. So we won't go over that again. Uh, but there's a couple other things that we worry about, especially in a pond, but sometimes in an aquarium, uh, that are toxins that can accumulate. And we mentioned that the, the bacteria that break down ammonia and nitrite, nitrate off into nitrate are aerobic bacteria which require oxygen. So you have to make sure that the water is flowing through your filter and circulating through your pond or your aquarium, that there's no dead spots in the, the tank where the water is not flowing readily. And what can happen is in an aquarium with very thick gravel or in a filter system that has poor water flow through it, or on the pond, on the bottom of the pond, if you have rocks or gravel on the bottom of the pond, there can be areas that don't get good water flow and they don't get the oxygen flowing through that area that it keeps the aerobic bacteria alive. So in those cases, you end up with a sludge that accumulates in an anaerobic condition, meaning no oxygen present. And you'll get a different type of bacteria that will grow, an anaerobic bacteria that utilizes uh, sulfur as an energy source instead of using oxygen and carbon. So then what happens is you get a gas that comes off that's called hydrogen sulfide. And you're probably familiar with that as a rotten egg odor. That rotten egg smell is actually very toxic and it's harmful to people, it's harmful to the fish. Uh, people have died cleaning out sumps uh, in, in farms and things like that that contain uh, rotting manure that gets anaerobic and they release that hydrogen sulfide gas. And you know, at first you think, oh, it's stinky, it smells like rotten eggs, but you don't realize it's like carbon monoxide that it will block your blood from carrying oxygen. So after a period of time smelling it, you may just pass out and die. Uh, so I've seen <coughs> a situation in a koi pond where the owner had a bunch of rocks on the bottom of the pond and they decided to clean those rocks out. And so, if you, you know, they got in the pond and they pulled the rocks out in the process. It stirred up this black sediment, this black debris, and they did smell this rotten egg odor. Well, fortunately, they were outside and it didn't overwhelm them. But what happened is later that day, that gas was dissolved from, from the, was trapped under the rock, it dissolved into the water. And the next day they woke up and all the fish were dead. So it is harmful to the fish. And if so, whenever you're cleaning the filter system, if you're smelling a rotten egg or if you're cleaning your pond and you smell a rotten eggs, you have to be aware that that gas, hydrogen sulfide, is also in the water and can kill the fish. So it's important in that case to aerate the water. And you can also um, provide uh, some help break down the hydrogen sulfide using hydrogen peroxide or sodium thiosulfate or potassium permanganate even at lower doses, which will ox uh, oxidize the hydrogen sulfide and, and help break it out faster. 
So uh, water changes would also be helpful in just diluting out that harmful gas that's dissolved in the water with fresh water. Um, so that's really, besides ammonia, is the next biggest toxin that accumulates, aside from chemical runoff. You know, I've had situations where uh, water from a, a driveway or a garage had run into a pond with chemicals from a car, from anything from oil to antifreeze, which are toxic, um, spraying for bugs, spraying uh, plants, uh, fertilizers, things like that around the pond, if they can run into the pond, can be toxic. Uh, so there are other contaminants that can get into the pond, but the ones that are actually created inside the pond would be ammonia and hydrogen sulfide. Wow. Yeah, I mean, that hydrogen sulfide is really no joke because <coughs> a lot of people think, you know, like, yeah, I'm going to add this really deep sand bed to aquarium or something like that, but, you know, they don't know that there's two types of bacteria, you know, oxygen loving and then oxygen hating. And surely an anaerobic bacteria does not, should not be exposed to oxygen because it will die, you know, um, and vice versa, you bury your, your aerobic bacteria underneath all that sand. So when you have like a deep sand bed in a, in a uh, reef tank or something like that, it's like you really don't want to disturb that bottom layer because one, you're going to kill your beneficial bacteria both ways. And then, yeah, you can uh, release all that hydrogen sulfide, which will then could crash your aquarium. So I'm pretty sure I, I could, I never really was able to determine this 100%, but I'm pretty sure I had this happen to me at one point because I made that mistake of digging. And yeah, because people will go in much, and they'll yeah. stir up the whole thing. And like Dr. said, then you're releasing all that gas yeah. and then bacteria both ways. Because I distinctly remember the rotten egg smell and then I. You know, it was a long, long time ago. I think it was like one of the first tanks I cared for. And uh, I just, yep. sends the breaks, you know, it happens. We all didn't learn. All right. Yeah, uh, Patrick, let me just put one more point. Patrick brought up about the deep, deep sand or gravel in an aquarium. If you took uh, like a long stick or a rod or some kind of an aquarium cleaning implement, and if you just sort of poke it into the gravel at a couple of yep. different places, and if you start seeing bubbles coming out from that, then you know you got uh, uh, anaerobic bacteria uh, and hydrogen sulfide forming. You, a lot of times you won't see it, but as soon as you start poking that gravel, you'll see bubbles come up. Yep. Yeah, and then you'll smell it. Then you smell it, yeah. <laughs> All right, so uh, we're just about finished up here. I think we have one more question, which uh, I guess we'll keep on the pond theme. It's actually probably for a lot of people, I imagine it's good pond season time right now, and we're in July and almost in July here. so. Uh, Dr. Nick, I'm going to pitch this one to you. What advice can be given for keeping koi safe from predators in a person's water garden or pond? Yeah, so there's a lot of different predators. So there could be people that could come and steal the fish out of your pond, which uh, has happened before. Uh, but a lot of times it could be cats, neighborhood cats, or, you know, dogs, rarely a problem getting fish, but certainly cats. Raccoons are a big issue. And then, uh, depending on where you live, uh, great blue herons and other fish-eating birds uh, that can attack the fish. So I'm sure there's probably, a, you know, uh, depending again on where you live, maybe some weasels or, or other things like that that can get to your fish. So how do you prevent that? For most koi people, um, the pond is in the backyard, so hopefully it's already fenced off, which will keep out a lot of things from wandering into your yard. Cats and raccoons can jump and climb fences. Birds will fly over it. So the next thing would be, uh, besides fencing off the pond or fencing off the yard, would be netting over the pond. Uh, sometimes it'll be like a, a complete net mesh that has uh, kind of like a swimming pool cover, but open, open netting. Uh, you do want light and air and gas exchange to occur, so you don't want like a plastic sheeting like you maybe would put over a swimming pool. Um, those aren't very attractive if you're out there sitting around the pond, so you might consider a form that's on either a frame that you can lift off and move, so when you're out enjoying the fish, you don't have it covering the pond, uh, or a netting that could be rolled back, and then when you're not present, roll it over the pond. There are uh, situations where people have put fish lines across the, the pond 
in, in like a, a network of, of strings, those are not as easily seen, so they don't look too bad. And then that keeps the birds from landing in the water and, and getting into the pond, so that may help. <coughs> um, having very deep, flat-sided pond edges, uh, like a swimming pool, keeps the fish, the, the birds from wading in the pond. You know, if it has a gradual slope like this, birds can land on the slope and then walk around the edge of the pond. If it just goes straight down, there's nowhere for them to land and stand. Um, so that helps. You can also provide some cover under the pond uh, in, in the water, uh, both for shade, but also to help the fish hide from predators. Uh, a few other predators. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, like ledges, you know, so that the fish can hide under them. Yeah, and, and then the few predators that people might not think about would be things like dragonfly larvae, which aren't a problem for large fish, uh, but if you have baby koi, uh, they, they're a uh, little, maybe an inch long larva of a dragonfly lives in the water, and they are predators, and they'll eat other small animals like baby fish. Uh, probably not a real big problem for most people, um, unless you're actively breeding koi. <clears throat> cool. Yeah, I was just thinking about some of the products that I there in the past with like it was like a, <laughs> the top of an alligator or a crocodile head that floated on the surface as like a predator deterrent I think yep. so for like larger birds or maybe some other animals see that and they thought oh geez there's an alligator or crocodile in the water so I better not land there. I know there are also yeah, there's like motion activated items too that you can buy like whether it be lights and sounds you know something comes within an area a you know, siren will go off or like a water sprinkler will go, will go off or something like that. You know, those are available as well. That's a good point. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that just about wraps it. We're at our 30 minute mark. So real quick, I just want to thank everybody who joined us in the live Q and A and, and uh, offer questions in the live chat. Hopefully, uh, hopefully you got the answer you're looking for. Hopefully you got some help from us. I uh, also want to thank uh, Patrick and Dr. Nick for their time today. Uh, lending their expertise and uh, general knowledge and experience to you guys, as well as myself. I learn something every single time we do this. So um, I guess on behalf of the team here, thank you all for joining us. Uh, we look forward to seeing you next Wednesday, next Wednesday at 1 p.m. for the same live Q&A like we did today. Uh, don't forget, next Tuesday, we are actually doing the live dive sale at 7.30 p.m. CST on Tuesday as uh, it's 4th of July. So uh, happy Independence Day. Happy 4th of July. Hope you have a great rest of your week, and we'll see you next Wednesday. Bye. Thank you all.